Hi, my name is Alicia Crockett, and I am the co-creator of the Portland School of Herbal Wisdom. I'm here today with Sean Donahue. Yeah. Hi, Sean. We are here today to talk about somatic herbalism and to talk a little bit about the 2018-2019 uh, year-long somatic herbalist practitioner training. So, Sean, I was hoping you would start out a little bit by telling us uh, what is somatic herbalism? A somatic herbalism really focuses on working with plants to bring subtle sensory signals to shift what it feels like emotionally and physically to be yourself embodied in the world in this moment. And we're really weaving together both very old traditions of vitalist medicine where the human being is understood to be a flowing river essentially, uh, where we are life moving across the terrain of a world and where the work of the healer is in shifting the direction, shifting the terrain, tending to the waters in order to allow that being to find its full expression in the world. And traditions of animist medicine that really understand our life as inseparable from the life that moves through all of the world and understand all of the world as alive and speaking to us and look to the ways in which connecting with each other and connecting with the living world itself help to define our sense of who we are and remind us and reorient us and bring us back into coherence. And with a field of somatic psychology that really looks at the fact that it's not just our words and ideas that shape our experience. In fact, they are very small part of our experience and often more the trace of where something else has moved, that it is actually in our emotions and our sensations and our felt sense of embodiment that our consciousness lies. And as we look to what the science of psychoneuroimmunology is discovering, that experience and sense of who we are in our bodies in the world right now shapes all of the instructions we give to our bodies about how to construct and conduct themselves in this moment. Our felt sense of who we are shapes not only our thoughts and our emotions, but also our chemistry as our endocrine systems based on our amygdala's perception of ourself in the world right now create chemicals to signal organs and tissues to behave in particular ways as our immune response determines based on our sense of who we are in the world right now what is us and what is not us what is healthy and what is unhealthy where we need to be defended and so in a world where both so much of what people struggle with experientially has to do with finding that embodied sense of being in the world. And where so many of the physiological health problems that we're dealing with as a culture, from heart disease to autoimmune disease to cancer to endocrine dysregulation, really have their a part of their root in imbalances and confusions in our sense of ourselves and in our being stuck in old emotion that exists outside this moment but is still held in our bodies as though we were living in another moment which is the definition of trauma. And so because it can be so hard for us to find in our cultural landscape examples of ways of being in the world that reflect deep embodiment and deep connection, often reaching outside our culture 
and even outside our species can be a way of beginning to find a different set of instructions at a biological level about right, our being. And so we bring in the subtle sensory shifts of plant medicines and their subtle chemistries and their subtle electromagnetic signatures to shift the body's impression of what's possible right now. I like that a lot, that image of stepping outside of ourselves and our story and our trauma and connecting with something that can help us bring us back to that connected sense, those plants. So would you talk a little bit about how that looks in your practice? How do you work with clients somatically? So the way Oliver Sacks said that there are only two meaningful diagnostic questions. Who are you? And how do you be? Who are you is a question that gets answered over time, both through our own experience and also through the meaning we gain in relationship, what gets reflected back to us. How we are in this moment is really at a gestalt how we are being in this moment is reflected by the gestalt of the sensations and emotions we're experiencing right now. So when someone is coming to me, there is some aspect of their life they're fundamentally struggling with. It might be a chronic physiological illness. It might be what our society calls anxiety, which really is um, the sort of outward expression of a feeling of unsafety, or what our society calls depression, which really is the inward retreat toward freezing um, that we, in response to a world that feels unsafe or a world that feels like we don't belong. It might be that they're noticing that um, their responses to the people that they love and the people that they work with are the kinds of responses they want to have. Whatever it is, we go and we investigate the moment where the pattern they most want to release is most active and just observe what are the emotions and sensations that show up in, that bo in their bodies when that pattern is most activated. And then we reach also to trying to find what, where is the greatest sense of wholeness and meaning and well-being in their lives. And when they're in that flow, what does that feel like in their bodies? And from that, we get a sense both of where, they, where the person is right now and where the person is moving, what the direction of that river is. And understanding where that river wants to flow we can make interventions to bridge that, help bridge that distance better and help that flow cross that distance better. Sometimes it's changes in the terrain, looking at where can this person be bringing in more support in their life and where can this person be removing obstacles in their lives. Sometimes it's in terms of nourishment, both their physiological nourishment and their spiritual nourishment, where do joy and wholeness flow from and how can we increase them? But there also often is that dimension of helping the body find the possibility of shifting from the one state to the other. And so we really work with the directions of how plant medicines shift our experience. So we all know experientially that if we taste cayenne, we're going to feel a stronger blood flow, a stronger awareness, a stronger focus throughout our bodies. If we taste a cucumber, we're going to feel things settle and cool and chill a little bit. So essentially, uh, Western herbal energetics is as simple as that, uh, although infinitely complex in its nuance, where we are feeling 
where does flow need to be faster? Where does flow need to be calmer? Where is there restriction against flow? Where is this person leaking out some part of their essence? And how can the felt sense in the body that a very small amount of plant medicine brings shift that experience in a moment? Because what we can feel, what we're able to feel in a moment becomes part of our somatic memory, our library of ways of being embodied. Mm -hmm. And the more we can become attuned with a different way of responding to a situation, the more we can allow what gets activated in us to be brought to a different resolution and come out of the places of habitual stuck patterns and into the places of letting life flow as it will. Mm. 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 Would you talk for a moment on how you think getting in touch with that subtlety of the somatic experience is helpful in today's world, kind of chaotic world? Yeah. Well, I would say it is tremendously helpful in shifting into a different way of being. It is tremendously helpful in bringing us in tune with the living world, with improving the quality of presence we have with each other. It's tremendously helpful in deepening relationships in what are essentially relational creatures. It will tend also, in many instances, to militate against the places the culture wants to push us. So it will create certain tensions. Um, As Krishnamurti first said, um, being well adjusted to a sick society isn't necessarily a sign of health. And so if when we're moving towards this health, uh, there is going to be some adjusting away from imposed expectations on our being and toward um, a different experience, an experience of wholeness, an experience of connectedness, uh, an experience of solidarity with each other, an experience of being part of the living world unfolding, which is really what the historical and current violence of our culture have cut ourselves off from. And it can be really scary to think about walking into that place, to think about walking away from uh, the ways we've been living. But really, it's the ways we've been living that are killing us. We can look at the two biggest addiction crises hitting our culture right now. And we look at the widespread addiction to opiates, which really has its root in people feeling more pain than their bodies can manage. Nobody's taking opiates because they're having a good time. Well, maybe they are occasionally briefly at a party, but nobody is engaged in a regular relationship with opiates because things are feeling good in their world. It's because that becomes the one thing that they've experienced that lets the physical and emotional pain of living be manageable to the point where they can experience something else, at least for a little while. So we have a crisis of pain in our culture, which comes from the fact that there's not the room to move through pain. There's not the room for our grief. There's not the room for our mourning there's not the room for our anger and so that there's not the room for the rest of what we need to feel either we can look at the methamphetamine crisis and methamphetamine um, as kind of Kirkrock points out is a phentylamine phentylamines are the same class of molecules as oxytocin which is our connected molecule the same class of molecules as mdma and as mescaline which are medicines that in some settings work to bring more connectedness. And so the methamphetamine crisis is largely a crisis of being starved for connection and the body taking its toxic chemical mimic 
as an acceptable substitute when there is no other substitute. And so these places we see the extreme place that this feeling can go to. But when we look at the ways that so many of us feel either numb or afraid so much of our lives, um, and we look at the long-term cost of inflammatory processes and autoimmune processes in our bodies, we begin to see um, the cost. And we also begin to see what separates us from the solution because the solutions are all in changing meaning and all in reweaving connection and all in reimagining our place in the world. But we get so caught in these physiological states where it's actually not biologically possible for us to perceive that possibility. And so really, um, this is about, this is for medial medicine to bring us back into embodiment and then back into humanity so that we can show up and work with each other to bring transformation. Well, I'm done with that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Uh, if you'd like to hear more about somatic herbalism and to dive deeply into this subject, the uh, Portland School of Herbalism is operating, I can't even speak, Portland School of Herbal Wisdom is offering a one-year program uh, on somatic herbalism. It's the somatic herbalist practitioner training, and Sean will be the lead instructor in that program, along with uh, Ray Swersey, another amazing herbalist, uh, Brant Stickley, who is an incredible acupuncture and pulse teacher in Portland, Oregon, and Kenneth Proferock is coming in to teach on uh, the body and the fascial system and how the fascial system holds emotions and what we can do with shifting those, the ways that our body holds, particularly trauma, but emotion in general. If you'd like to learn more, you can visit us at www.portlandschoolofherbalwisdom.com and we hope to see you there. We hope you'll join us. Thank you. Thank you.